Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's roundtable, we've got the usual suspects. We've got the big papa, Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are you? I'm great. Happy to be on. Awesome. We're awesome. We got the breathe in the mailing, breathe out the marketing. Mike Zano. What's up, Mike? Not much. How you doing? I'm so glad you're safe after all the gas explosions in your area. That was crazy. Yeah, yeah. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? I'm doing good. Good, good. We've got Mimi, the terrorist hunter Schmidt. Hello, Mimi. Hi, how are you? Good, good. We got Bearland Aaron. He's back after a little hiatus. Good to see you, Aaron. Good to see you, everybody, too. And of course, you know him. You love him. The professor, the brain, Six Sigma, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? Pulse is still normal. Respiration's fine. I can't complain. Um, we have a new nickname for Mimi. What is yeah, it? Yeah. It was Mimi Jack Ryan. Oh, yeah. yeah that's what it was. <laughs> I watched it for the first time last night. It was really good. I watched two episodes. It was fun. It was good. So oh, it's good. Mimi Jack Ryan Schmidt. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Mimi, which do you prefer? The Terrace Hunter. All right. We're going to go with Terrace Hunter. <laughs> she shot down Scott's nickname. <laughs> All, all good. What, listen, what, it does seem a little weird that we would say Mimi and then give it like a guy's name, Jack Ryan. You know, I, that's, yeah. Jacqueline Ryan. Yeah, or maybe Mimi Ryan, but that yeah. would confuse everyone. Uh, it's, people start calling her Ryan. Yeah, I don't know. But you know what? The, the official Land Geek Motivation Group has been generous this week, and they have teed up some excellent questions for us. So let's – go to the round table and ask this question. The first question is from Laura is regarding pricing when selling a parcel. She says she checked comps online and she found a range, but there's a big range. So when do you know to lower your price without giving the parcel away? Let's start with the Zen master. So when to lower the price without giving it away? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. I think that, you know, you got to competitively price your parcel, but the advantage that we have over everybody else is that we're buying them so cheap, right? So, you know, we can basically sell retail, but we sell on, you know, you know, on a small monthly payment. People spend more money on coffee. I always say it, right? They literally will spend more money at Dunkin' Donuts than they will for a parcel of land, you know? Um, but uh, so I don't think that initially, uh, you know, that, like trying to, mark it down or, or worry about, I, I, I don't, no, I don't think that really applies. And I, I'm thinking more that, uh, you know, we have the ability to sell these parcels at retail or even more than retail because people are focusing on the monthly payment. That's where our real uh, selling point is that we can, you know, we can allow them to buy something so cheap. So it's definitely not going to happen right away. I'm not going to try to come in. Now, if I wanted to get a cash sale, yeah, then I'd want to come in uh, really competitive right below everybody else if I was trying to force that cash sale but uh, I don't know am I, am I answering the question I'm not even sure I am <laughs> I don't know Eric is he answering the question or is he kind of ducking it no I think he answered part of the question anyways um, in terms of you know how when to lower the price or if to lower the price um, yeah I think you got it okay great great so I just went on Facebook I, are you sure we're going live we're streaming live right now. It says it is. I don't see it. I mean, it says it on our end, but I don't know if I said it right on, on Facebook. But I'm not seeing it on Facebook, but I'm it says it is. It. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to call the streaming go live. What's that? There's like one more button right at the end. Oh, see, I didn't hit that. Yeah. So that's what it is. So I'm going to just put in the link here to see the, wait, it says copy streaming link. I screwed it up. 
This is not working. Well, so, on our end it is. All right, I'm gonna go. I know, but I did something wrong. All right, so I'm gonna go to more, stop live stream, and then do it again. Because I don't see it on, uh, on I see your question. Any questions for the round table panel? That All right, so let's try it again. See, Mike, you, it's, I'm blaming Mike because I can't take responsibility for any technical issues at all. <sighs> it's a problem. But let's let's go to to Mimi, and um, while we're setting this up, uh, Mimi, how would you answer that question? As far as when do you lower the price, and and how do you even get a, an idea when the comps are all over the place? The comps are all over the place. Um, I use financial calculator, the ten IVB, is that what it's called? Let me make sure. Ten I. Right, and so I want my IRR to be over 100%. So if I've looked at the sales data, and I've looked at uh, Land Moto and Craigslist and Land and Farm, and got for with the type of property I have and what it should be selling for, I don't always just have one price for a piece of property. I, I vary it to see what people will bite on, and then mark what, what sells more frequently, right? And it's usually a cheaper, more easy to pay monthly payment. Right? Um, right, but I, I won't. I usually don't price below 100% of the IRR. And then if there's downward pressure on the market and you want to go, I won't go below 80%. When it gets to lower than 80, then I start considering whether I should be in that. I see. I see. Eric Peterson, do you do anything differently? Um, I don't know that I do anything specifically different. I. I wonder if the if the nature of the question comes down to, you know, I think when a lot of people start off um, buying and selling land, they want to sell the property, right? And and that's always kind of the, the biggest hurdle to, to overcome once you own the property is, you know, now you got to sell it. And, um, you know, people freak out. They, they put their ads out. Um, they advertise it on Facebook, Craigslist, wherever, Landmoto. And, uh, you know, they're not selling the property. People are asking questions about it. Maybe they're inquiring to, to some degree, but, but no one's pulling the trigger to buy it. And, you know, I think it's, it's really easy to, to start to feel like, okay, well, maybe I didn't price it right. I got to lower the, the price a couple hundred dollars today or, or next week or whatever. Um, but ultimately, it's just about bringing enough buyers, potential buyers, to, to see your ads. Because I think what we find oftentimes is it takes somewhere around 50 leads to sell the property. So if you've achieved that, but yet you don't have a sale, then you know maybe it's all right to start considering lowering the, lowering the price. I mean, you should have plenty of room to be able to do that if you bought the property right. So I don't know, that's my thought on it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Bearland Aaron, what are your thoughts? Um, Often I will first raise the price just to see if it is some, like if I missed it and cause sometimes when they're too cheap, people steer away. They're not sure why it's so cheap, you know? So, um, some, sometimes I'll go ahead and just raise that cash price or, um, you know, the monthly payment, um, you know, maybe $10 or something like that just to see what happens if I don't get any traction with that, then I consider lowering it. Um, and oftentimes what I'll do first before I actually lower the price across all my ads, you know, like maybe change my land moto listing to have a different price, that sort of thing is, um, you know, I'll kind of shoot it out on the buyer's list or even um, a special Facebook ad to the buy sell groups where I, you know, listed at the price that, you know, I have it listed at, but I work some sort of extra deal, you know, some sort of, you know, got to sell now, Facebook special, you know, this weekend only if you, you know, you know, I'll, I'll give it to you for this price, you know, or same thing on the mail list on that sort of thing. Um, and then, 
if I still don't do anything, then, then I have to consider, well, maybe I overpriced this property, you know, and we, you know, we did buy it cheap. So, you know, there's a lot of room there. So, you know, I can start working it down. And I've done that a couple times and like hit a point where all of a sudden people are just all over it, you know, so, um, but I don't go a lot at a time, you know, just small increments over time and see, you know, you'll see where it kind of clicks in. And then, you know, then, you know, when you're buying the next property out there, Hey, this is where I now I need to be. So you can change your offers and that sort of thing to be, you know, where you want to be margin wise. Yeah. I love that because then once you get that sale at that price, you really get the right data and then, you know, can do that. Um, that next, that next batch of offer letters, you know, you take that, sale price and you divide by four and that's your comp yeah. right there. Uh, that next, that next batch of all. For sure. So uh, Tate, what about you? What's your thoughts? You know, honestly, I don't change my pricing that much. Once I've, dis once I've determined what a property is worth, I mean, that's kind of what I go with. Um, I don't ever really feel the need to fire sale properties because I'm in it for the long run. And I think, you know, like Eric said, we get that anxiety that we need to sell, sell, sell super quickly. But the more property you have and the more property you have on, on the market, the less likely you are to feel this way. So, I mean, if you have 10 or so properties in your inventory and you're getting leads on a few of them, well, the ones that might be quote unquote priced too high, it, it doesn't really matter because you're always moving other properties. So um, I think on my pricing, I tend to be on the high end. I look at a lot of the comps and mine are almost always more expensive than everyone else's yet. I'm still selling property as fast as I can get it. So I don't really change my pricing that much. I'm competitive. It all comes down to the way we do our due diligence and our County research and our, and our pricing of individual lots. But once we've decided what we're going to get for it, we factor that in ahead of time and it kind of determines what we pay for. I love it. I love it. Uh, Scott Todd. Well, you know, Mark, what we see a lot of times is we see people that they, they want to go to the higher end because they, they, they have put a price on it. Uh, you know, like they, they've looked at it, at it and they've said, well, okay, this property's worth $10,000 or they really want $10,000, right? Like they saw a comp out there. It was like $10,000 and they're like, man, I really want to sell this property for $10,000. And so then they go to the high side. And then what we see sometimes is they hang out the high side. And it's cool when you're, when you're like Tate, and I would sound like at that point too, you know, you get to the point where you're just like, whatever, it, it sells, it doesn't sell, it will sell eventually. Um, however, when you're new and you're trying to kind of get going and you're, you're kind of like needing to sell one to go buy one and, and it's that mindset, well, then if you try to hover on the high side, you know, and hang out there, well, then it's going to take the sales process a lot longer. So why not kind of begin to move back down? Give it, give it two weeks. The market's talking to you. The market's always talking to you. It's talking to you with your response rate. It's talking to you when you place Craigslist ads or Landmoto ads and you, you do or don't get responses to those ads. The market is talking to you. And what you need to do is you need to listen to the market because it's not what you want. It's what the market wants. And so you kind of have to look at it and go, well, man, I've ran this ad for this property for two weeks. I put it on everywhere I can think of. I'm not getting any response and I've got it for $10,000. Great. No problem. The market's talking to you. Begin to lower it, lower it to the next tier, whatever you've determined that next tier is. I mean, every property is going to be a little bit different. Lower it to the next tier. But essentially what you want to do is you want to find that midpoint to where like you find the person that says, I want the property. And then the terms price kicks in and all the other stuff doesn't really matter because you found the market, but the market's always talking to you. A lot of times people don't listen to it. Right. Right. For, for you, Eric, the metric is once I get 50 leads on this one ad and it doesn't sell, is that the point in time where you say, okay, something needs to change with the pricing. Either I'm going to go higher like Bearland Aaron, because maybe the market thinks it's too good to be true or you go lower. What's your 
sort of litmus tests to change that pricing? So, I mean, for me, it's, it's pretty much that. So those, those 50 leads, if, if I'm tracking those closely and I'm seeing that and I'm ready to move that property, then, you know, I'm going to relook at the market and decide if I want to go up, down or whatever and, uh, and make the decision at that point. However, oftentimes, you know, just like Tate was saying, I mean, I've got enough inventory that sometimes I'm okay just letting them be and, you know, waiting it out. But um, early on when you only got, you know, a couple properties, I think that's, that's kind of a good metric to look at. If you're getting 50 leads, but you're not able to convert a sale, consider, you know, checking your comps and then make an educated decision about, you know, how to revise your pricing. Right, right. Just, you know, I'm going to quickly go around and just ask everybody, but um, I know that, you know, we like to do it where we'll take a comp, right? And like screenshot the comp and then put a line through it. So we're anchoring it, right? So let's say for example, the comp that we like is $10,000. Then we'll put a line through that comp and say ours is 9,200, right? And essentially anchoring the price to 10,000 and, and signifying the market, look, you're getting a deal on this, right? And that this is how we're showing you that you're, you're getting essentially, you know, this, this 8% discount on this property or whatever it is. Um, I don't know if I'm doing my math right, but um, I think I'm not. Anyways, I, I digress. Uh, Tate, are you using anchoring? Yeah, absolutely. Zen it's master? Nice. Especially in wholesale, yes. The technician? Yes. Terrace hunter? Yes. Bearland? Yes, but yes. you need to do it more. <laughs> you need to do it more? Um, yeah. The professor? You're not anchoring? You're on mute. Sorry, don't do it, no. You don't, don't do, do it. it. I mean, I think the fact that Scott doesn't do it and is still as successful <laughs> as he is kind of says, hey, I could be more successful. There's still room to improve. This is behavioral economics 101, Scott Todd. No, I, I get it. I, I know. I know. It's, He's um, just thumbing his nose at technique. Look, I'm just – He's so good. Like, I, I'm going to – like, I'm going to write my own book one day. Say, so you guys are all wrong. Siri, send Scott Todd <laughs> the book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, Daniel Kahneman. Okay. So speaking of – books. It's a perfect segue to our tip of the week. So for those of you that are watching on Facebook, thank you so much for spending time with us. I'm going to stop the streaming so that you're all encouraged to actually subscribe to the podcast and download the podcast because that actually helps us and, um, and listen for the tip of the week. So I'm going to stop now. All right, Eric Peterson, what is your tip of the week? A website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? You're going to just hand it off to me? All right, I'll take it. So thelandgeek.com slash reading list. Uh, there you're going to find recommendations from... I think just about all of us here on the podcast, all the, all the coaches anyways, um, just, you know, the, some books we'd recommend and, and maybe why we might recommend them. So take a few minutes and take a look and, you know, get an audible book or get a paper book. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's pick on the Zen master and his three books. He's got the E-Myth Revisited, The Science of Getting Rich, and The Obstacle is the Way. Of those three books, Mike, and you're on a desert island for 90 days, and you can only bring one of those books, which would you bring and why? Well, Think and Grow Rich, the, uh, the one that Scott, and the reason I got this one from a pod, one of these roundtables, right, Scott? You brought this up, this book, and uh, right. 
I just think it's such a mindset shift. That's like mindset shift. Say that three times fast. Uh, it it just really alters your uh, uh, per, you know perception of reality. So I think that's the way I go. It's like a mantra. That book. It's like a long mantra, and it really works. And so I go with that. And um, I think we're gonna get a new nickname for Scott. Though can I say this now? Because every time I say professor, I say Professor Ann, Marianne here. I, 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 I gotta get a new. It just. Just like I can't get, I'm glad you didn't go with Jack Ryan for me because I can't get, it's like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. It's all I hear every time you say Jack Ryan. So I think we got to stick with Tara Sunda. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sorry for the segue, but the, uh, think and grow rich, that one. Think and grow rich, okay. So it's the science of getting, the, the science, science, of, science, of, science of, yeah, yes. no, Think and Grow Rich is a great book by Napoleon Hill. That's like right, a classic so book, but so this is different. This is one. This yeah. is the, this, when was this written, Scott? 1910? Uh, 1900? Oh, man. That's a long time ago. Yeah. And there's a companion book, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day, that's very similar. I didn't Arnold it Bennett. Anymore. I've read that book. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it's, the, it's going to shake on, on Audible, there's uh, the trilogy of The Science of Getting Rich, The Science of Being Well, and The Science of Being Great by that author. So they're probably free, right? I think Audible, like they call them classics, and don't even really charge much. A penny, maybe. Uh, I don't even know. It's like a dollar ninety-five or four eighty-six, depending on. Yeah, they're cheap. Yeah, you know what's not on the reading right list, now. by the way, because we're so not self-promotional here, is Dirt Rich. So there's lots of bonuses worth Dirt Rich, um, including two free due diligence reports. Um, a $500 coupon, some other goodies, just go to the landgeek.com forward slash dirt rich. And you won't see it on the reading list because Danielle hates when I self promote. So I have to do it on the round table. But and we speaking, figure everyone's already got it, right? And everyone's probably already got it because it's the most relevant of the books. If you're interested in land investing. Um, that being said, I do want to mention that Today's podcast is sponsored by Nightcap. Nightcap is epic. They sing, they dance, they drink <laughs> obsessively. It is the most fun you're going to have on a Wednesday or Thursday night. Thursday. So just go to the Land Geek official motivation group and see when uh, Nightcap is streaming live with the Zen master, Mike Zeno, and dude buddy, Scott Bossman. And if you're shy, you just want to talk to them directly, go to the landgeek.com forward slash training and schedule a call. So we, it was really important that we had, uh, especially for the big papa, a 30-minute roundtable podcast because he does have the pretentious hard stop with the baby. And I think we made it. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Mike? We're great. We're great. Eric? Yep, it's another one for the books. Mimi? Great. Bearland? I love you guys. It's great. We, we love you too. Uh, how many weeks of boot camp? Is it four? Uh, four more weeks. Wow. Is there any openings? Are we booked? I don't know. I'm pretty sure we're booked up. I spoke to Danielle today. She's trying to get a bigger room, but at this point, I think we are at standing room only capacity. So we might get two more, three more in, but it's, you know, we might be at fire code violation at that point, which I know for you, Mike, would not be good. Yeah, he, can't, he can't be part of a fire code violation. He can't be part of the fire code, yeah. That would not Absolutely. go well for Mike. Right, right. So I just want to just t check in with the big papa to make sure he's happy with the pace and length of the Roundtable podcast today. Yeah, I was happy. It was good. I feel like we, we touched on all the uh, – on some really good – topics today so the pace was good the timing's perfect i'm good i got nothing to complain about here all right great and i just want to remind all the listeners um please support the podcast you got to subscribe you got to rate you got to review the podcast send us a screenshot of that review to support at the .com. we are going to send you for free our 97 dollar passive income launch kit thank you so much are we ready are we doing this we are one, two, three.
Let, Let it freedom, freedom ring. That was good. That was, that was a good, good one. That was pretty good. I think, you know, it's just kind of sad to see Bearland not say it, though. <laughs> you know, Bearland, do you want to just say it? Just Let freedom ring. I think that's the way to end the podcast. Thanks, everybody. So from here on out, Bearland gets.